Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have each of you here. Let's all stand together, please. We're going to have a word of prayer. Dedicate our time to the Lord today. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this beautiful day you've created. Thank you for the rain this week and just the refreshing showers that have watered the crops and, and the flowers and the, and the grass. And thank you for the animals, the little birds I heard singing this morning as I came in. And just thank you for your creation, God. It certainly does declare the glory of God. And we praise you for this time together to worship. And I pray, God, your blessings upon all that's done in music as well as in the Word of God this morning as we listen and, and take it in. I pray for those who are working with our kids that you just bless and use them in a, in a mighty way. And in Jesus' precious name, amen. Hey, the worship band's going to warm up a little bit. Turn around and, and either wave, high five, knuckle bump, shake hands, whatever. Just greet someone. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. 
morning, Grace Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Bear with me just a moment. This week, as we were looking through songs and trying to figure out uh, what to play, um, uh, and just contemplating on how life treats us and, and some of the things that we deal with and work through, and, and uh, we know that we can count on Him. And I was, uh, so I, I ran across this scripture, and most of you probably know this, but um, it just touched me this week. Isaiah 41 10 says fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand and we can take comfort in that and uh, this is this is just one of those one of those times where we've run through some trouble and you know as long as we keep our eyes on him we remain focused on him um, we'll get through this because he is able and that's our next song Oh, no, no. 
Father, I just want to thank you for everybody here today, Lord, and the fact that you are able. Um, I pray that as we go about our day, you would just watch over us and that you would bless the sermon and bless the auction later. And in your name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Try 
rise too high and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. Folks, we're going to recognize Ashley Stark this morning. And Ashley, could you come right out up here, please? I want people to be able to have a chance to get to know you and meet you. But Ashley uh, <clears throat> is a godly young lady. i just uh, thankful for Ashley and just the love for Christ that she has in her life and if you ever read her blog, she's a deep thinker, and uh, really, and her, her thoughts are on the Lord and on His Word, and just a very good writer. And but more importantly, loves the Lord. And I and Ashley, um, we are glad to be part of your church family. And uh, I'm not going to make you talk in front of everybody, okay? So don't fear not. But we have a card for you, a graduation card from the church family as an expression of our love, and also 
I thought, we thought this would really fit well. It's a journal, and um, it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and plans to give you hope and a future, Jeremiah 29, 11. That's one of my favorite passages in Scripture, and um, also I know that's your favorite color, right? And uh, Ashley is going to be uh, going to Iowa State, and it's too bad she's not going to the University of Iowa, to Hawkeye country, but, you know, hey, that just gives us more to pray about, amen? No, I'm kidding. But she's going to be uh, studying graphic arts, and um, we need to pray for Ashley because really, Ashley, again, you're being, you're going to go right into a, 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 you know, what can I say, a mission field, and uh, you're going you're gonna to face the onslaught of evil and pressure and just like you did when you're at Grinnell High School and uh, but we're going to pray hard for you we're going to support you with prayer and I know there's I know there's there's good church uh, ministries there in that college and um, so I, I hope you'll get involved in that but um, can we just have a word of prayer for Ashley this morning and just lift her to the Lord Father, I just thank you for Ashley. Thank you for the love that she has for Jesus Christ, her boldness, and she's not ashamed. And she has spoken openly and boldly about her faith in the Lord, uh, both at school, before teachers, before classmates, as well as on her blog, on Facebook. And I just thank you for her boldness and her love for Christ. And uh, Lord, I pray as she ventures out into her future and pursues you and pursues you and all of her future plans. God, I pray that you put a hedge of protection around her and help her to be controlled by the Spirit, clothed in the armor of God, and, uh, and just take a stand for what's right and for what's good and help her to be the light and the salt that you called her to be. And God, use her in a great way up there at Iowa State. And we ask your blessings upon her to continue. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you, Ashley. God bless you. Let's give her a hand. How many promised to pray for Ashley? All right, put her on your prayer list, all right, and, and hold her up in prayer. And before we uh, have our sermon this morning, um, we need to pray for Linda Gow. She's home, not feeling well today. And Brother Al is home and not feeling well today. And so I just want us to take some time to pray for them, if you would, if we would, let's bow our head and close our eyes. Father, I lift Al to you today in prayer and ask that you would touch his body and strengthen him and heal him. God, just uh, minister to his needs. I think of Linda, who's not been feeling well. God, please touch her. And um, Lord, we just are so thankful that you're the great physician. And God, that uh, you can handle any situation of our life. And so we commit these precious people to you in prayer. We know there's a lot, a lot of folks that need prayer, and those are just the two that immediately come to my mind right now. And I just pray for them and I ask you to bless them in a special way. Thank you for the time to study the word, and I ask your blessings on the preaching of the word today. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll let the kids go to the edge, so K through 5th, uh, Brother Walt's over there ready to teach you, and, and he's excited and well prepared. Everybody else, if uh, you have your lesson sheet is inside that bulletin there, just go ahead and grab that lesson sheet, and uh, we'll continue on here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, <clears throat> I've entitled this lesson, Don't Be Shaken. I heard about a guy who wanted to get over his phobia of riding on horses. So he decided the best way to do that is face that fear head on, so he went horseback riding. He located a horse, paid the fee, and got on that horse, and he started to ride. At first, it was a, it was a gentle ride, and he thought, this is not that bad. I can handle this. He just kind of galloped along and no problem. And uh, <clears throat> I can do this. His confidence was building. After a little bit, the horse started going faster. Uh, and then the ride was getting more bumpy, and he was, you know, bumping back up and, up and down, and the horse was, was really going pretty quick. And, and that was pretty exciting because, 
the, the speed, it was really going pretty good. And, and then it really started speeding up. And, and with all the strength, uh, he was hanging on. And pretty soon, he started slipping from his saddle. Uh, and then a piece of his cloth, a piece of his shirt or pants got caught. And, and, and all of a sudden, he was upside down, hanging, hanging by his clothing on this horse that was just going super fast. And his head bumped on, on the ground a couple of different times. And he's starting to get dizzy and starting to lose consciousness. And he was very fortunate because an employee walked up and unplugged the coin-operated horse. So, all right. I hope that made your life a little better today, all right? Maybe not. Maybe now you're angry and say, get on with it, Pastor. But he was shaken up, right? And that's kind of what we call this lesson, don't be shaken. You know, if you've ever lived in California, which I don't have any plans to in the near future, but if you ever lived in California, you have probably experienced an earthquake at some point. Uh, it could have been a slight tremor, prolonged trembling, where dishes fell off the shelf, or cracks in the walls, blaring fire alarms, frightened children, frightened adults. A couple pictures up here of some uh, things that happened in one of the California earthquakes. One guy lost his fireplace, and uh, you can see even more catastrophic things that happened sometimes. The road collapsed, and, and uh, the National Earthquake Information Center uh, says <clears throat> now locates about 20,000 earthquakes around the globe each year, approximately 55 a day. And ironically, sometimes there are actually tremors in the Midwest. I don't know if you knew that. And, uh, but scientists expect about 16 major earthquakes each year. In the past 50 years, records show that we have exceeded the long-term average number of major earthquakes about a dozen times. So many of us, many of us have maybe been through one or, uh, or we have heard of the big one, uh, the future earthquake that could strike in California along the St. Andreas Fault that would register, they say, scientists say it could register on the Richter scale at 8.5 or more. And God forbid that will happen, but we know in, we know in the end time events there's going to be some major earthquakes that will shake the world. Uh, like the world's never seen. But you know, let me just kind of go from a physical shaking of an earthquake to the Thessalonian believers because they were shaken. They were shaken within their soul. They had their own personal earthquake. They had their own trembling, their inner trembling that was occurring. There was some, some teaching among them stating that they were in, they were actually in the day of the Lord. And if this, if this were true then, these Thessalonian believers then thought they had missed the rapture uh, and that they are now in the tribulation period, which, by the way, is one of the several events that are included in uh, the day of the Lord, which is an extended period of time which God intervenes and, and brings judgment upon this world. Their current persecution they were going through, coupled with this alarming news that they were hearing, confused them, and it shook them to the core. Now, Paul just told them about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. He also reminded them that they would not suffer God's wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-9. Now these reports they were receiving stated that they were in the day of the Lord, along with a fake letter that the Apostle Paul supposedly wrote, uh, and that really upset them and shook their faith. So Paul, in the second letter, is trying to clear some confusion about end-time events and correct some teaching that uh, they are receiving. Don't be shaken. That's what Paul tells these believers. Don't be shaken. Let's pray. Father, a lot of things going on in our world right now. There's a lot of things that can shake us. Some of us got a medical report this, this week that could shake us. Some of us are seeing things on the news that it shakes us, God. It, it, it causes our own inner turmoil and inner earthquake. And, and if we're not careful, we can become quite distracted and, and deviate from the path that God has called us to. 
And Lord, uh, these Thessalonian believers were shaken by some teaching that was inaccurate and they were struggling in their spiritual life. And God, I pray that today the, the word of God that is shared would be an encouragement to every believer. I pray it would be a wake-up call to our responsibility to share the gospel. I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know the Lord, that today would be the day they say yes to Jesus and, and trust you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that you'd use this time together for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. In your, pres in our, in your precious name of Jesus, amen. amen. Notice, first of all, the day of the Lord has not occurred yet. That's what Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians 2.1. In verse 2, he says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, let's stop right there for a moment. That uh, word coming there is repeated over and over and over again throughout 1 Thessalonians. He mentioned it in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, chapter 3, verse 13, chapter 4, verse 15, chapter 5, verse 23. Uh, Four of those five uh, events there that I just mentioned to you, Paul mentioned the coming of the Lord. He's talking about the rapture uh, when Christ comes back and snatches us out of this world and will be gathered to him and literally uh, speaks of a meeting, uh, a time of worship, an assembly. And Paul started out with a reminder to these struggling believers about the rapture of the church that he already spoke to them about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. The Apostle Paul believed that event would happen in his lifetime. At any moment, Jesus Christ will come and the, and the dead in Christ will rise first and believers who are alive on earth at that time will be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. And, and uh, since Paul has already passed off the scene, he's in heaven, uh, that event could happen to us. And before I get done preaching or before the week's out, you know, we could be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. But Paul included himself at the time that he wrote this in the teaching on the rapture. And when it does happen, it's going to be a very quick event in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I believe it's going to happen uh, before the tribulation starts. There are varied opinions on the timing of the rapture. Some in this very room here believe it happens at, at a different time. And, 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 you know, hey, that's fine. But Paul assured these Thessalonian believers in his first letter that they would not experience the period of judgment in this world known as a tribulation period. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us, Paul included himself in that, he rescues us from the coming wrath. He says it again in, in chapter 5, verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, he uses the plural pronoun us there, including himself. And we know that when the rapture happens and we're caught up to be with the Lord in the air, uh, that the tribulation period will start. It'll last for seven years. This tribulation period will have seven seal judgments. In the seventh seal judgment, there are seven trumpet judgments. Contained within that seventh trumpet judgment are seven bowl judgments. There are 21 judgments overall in the seven-year period, and they grow with intensity. And this time period is going to start when the church is caught up to be with the Lord in the air. And since believers are not suffering the wrath of God in the tribulation period, I don't believe they're going to experience the tribulation period nor are they going to experience the extended period of time known as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord follows the rapture of the church. It includes that seven-year tribulation period. It includes the second coming of Christ. It includes the millennial reign of Christ. It includes the final destructions, uh, destruction of the heavens and the earth. As I mentioned here a few weeks ago, there are about 19 Old Testament passages that mention the day of the Lord. It's mentioned four times in the New Testament. And Paul says, we ask you, brothers, verse 2, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, 
or letter supposed to have come from us saying the day of the Lord has already come. That little phrase, easily unsettled, means to waver or to totter, to move to and fro. The, the whole picture is instability. Uh, the same word is used in Matthew eleven seven, 7, describing a, we, a reed that is swayed by the wind. Or the stars will fall from the sky, Matthew 24, 29, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Uh, Acts 4, 31, after they prayed, the meeting place was shaken. Again, it's used in Acts 16, 26. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Acts 17, 13 describes the Jews who went to Berea uh, to cause trouble, and they went there to agitate the crowd. There it is used again, stirring them up. And so the believers at Thessalonica were seriously shaken with the impact of thinking that they were in the day of the Lord. It was a major earthquake. They were experiencing major spiritual aftershock. Paul says, we ask you brothers not to be easily unsettled or alarmed. Translated frightened. Uh, used in Matthew 24 and verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it you are not alarm the same word is translated there uh, alarm such things must happen but the end is still come it's also used in mark 13 and verse 7 so paul did not want them to become easily unsettled and alarmed by some prophecy some teacher going along claiming that their teaching came from god when it didn't and and reporting something that it wasn't accurate or by some report some something that they heard that somebody said that was inaccurate according to uh, the Word of God, or by some letter that they supposedly received from the Apostle Paul saying that the day of the Lord already had come. That fake letter uh, contradicts what Paul wrote in the first letter to the Thessalonian believers. He already told them that they'd be caught up to be the Lord uh, at the rapture and they would not suffer the wrath of God. So why would the Apostle Paul write another letter telling them just the opposite? The answer is, he didn't write this so-called letter that stated the day of the Lord had already occurred. And so Paul here is having to defend himself a little bit and try to clear up some confusion. Even back then, they had trouble with identity theft. The day of the Lord has not occurred yet. The second thing he brings out here is that the day of the Lord follows certain events first event that he brings out here is that the rebellion must occur. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day, referring to the day of the Lord, will not come until the rebellion occurs. The word rebellion is where we get our English word apostasy. It's translated falling away. Uh, it means to place oneself away or to stand away from somebody. It's referring to the defection, of, uh, defection of the faith, from the faith. There's always been those who have turned their backs on the Lord and denied the faith and walked away. Josh Harris, a professing Christian, wrote a book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And then he kissed the Lord goodbye and denied the faith. Marty Sampson wrote Christian songs and has since denied the faith. John Cooper, lead singer of a Christian group, has denied the faith. Many of us know people in our life that we have interacted with that at one time said they believed, but since have denied the faith. And their life reflects that, right? Right? I mean, the whole problem is they never had the faith. Eh? They never knew Christ to begin with. 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, John says. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but they're, they're going out that none of them belong to us. Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me, Paul wrote. It has gone to Thessalonica apostasy has always been going on but it's going to escalate big time as we are in the last days it's going to grow exponentially fewer than 50 percent of the americans all the u.s belong to church 
There are many who grew up in church who no longer attend and are now are, are categorized by statisticians as a group known as the nuns. Not N-U-N, not a Catholic nun, but as the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They have no church affiliation. They have walked away from the faith and from the word of God. And they are also go by the label ex-evangelicals. They are no longer an evangelical. They are an ex-evangelical. They have exited the church maybe because of a hurt inside the church or because they don't believe uh, the Bible's stand on sexuality. Or they don't accept the authority of scriptures. Or they, they don't believe the reality of sin. Or the necessity of Jesus' atonement. Or his deity. Or the exclusivity of Christ. They're believing a lie that all roads lead to God. But all roads don't lead to Des Moines, right? If all roads don't lead to Des Moines, all roads don't lead to God. Only through Jesus Christ. Amen? 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And the, and the big age bracket that has really taken a hit are the millennial age, the millennial age group, which is the 18 to, to the 25-year-old bracket. They get off to the college and the professor stands up there and says there's no God and, and the professor might give all kinds of arguments and confuse and if that person's not grounded in the word of God, their faith is shaken. Before the day of the Lord starts, the rebellion must occur first. One thing that COVID has revealed It's revealed that many have abandoned. I mean, I've talked to pastors of other churches, and many have abandoned. They have walked away. And uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, maybe one day we can get them back. But in a lot of cases, I don't think we ever will. The rebellion must occur first before the day of the Lord starts. Notice, letter B: the Antichrist must be revealed. Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. This is none other than the Antichrist. We all know him by the Antichrist, but here he's called the man of lawlessness. He is the little horn of Daniel 7, 8. He's the king, the insolent one, one who is skilled in intrigue in Daniel 8, 23. He will rise from among ten kings and he'll take over three kingdoms. He's the prince who is to come, Daniel 9, 26. He's the one who makes desolate, Daniel 9, 27. He's a king who does as he pleases, Daniel 11, 36 through 45. He's called the foolish shepherd in Zechariah 11, 15 through 17. He is the man of lawlessness here in verse 3. He is the lawless one in verse 8. He's the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6-2. The one with no arrows but just has an empty bow. He's coming to bring peace, false peace. He's the beast out of the earth, Revelation 13, 1-2. There are all kinds of titles. These are few. There are more titles for the Antichrist. But that most popular titles are already mentioned for this evil world ruler is the Antichrist, and his anti means against or instead of. He opposes Christ and everything about Christ. He wants to replace Christ. He's the counterfeit Christ. When he's riding on the white horse, he's going to have a crown on his head, and, and uh, he's going to have all the answers, and he's going to perform miracles and, and signs and wonders, and people are going to fall and worship this guy. He wants to be worshipped. He wants allegiance instead of us worshipping the true Christ and giving allegiance to the true Christ. Scripture says that he will be revealed here in verse 3. Unveiled. The curtains will be pulled back. The world will see him. If you see a peace treaty being signed in the Middle East with Israel among all the Arab nations that surround them and that there's peace, 
and someone negotiated that peace and got it going, hey, man, then I was wrong in the timing of the rapture, okay? 1 John 2.18, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. But even now, many Antichrists have come, and this is how we know it's the last hour. There are a lot of people that have characteristics of the future Antichrist, they're totally bent on evil, and uh, they don't worship the Lord, and really they want worship for themselves. There are a lot of people like that. First John 2.22, who is a liar? The man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. First John 4.3, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Many deceivers, 2 John 7, who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. But the ultimate Antichrist is going to show up one day. He's the ultimate rebel, and he's coming. He will lead the world in rebellion, deception, one world worship of himself, which really is worship of Satan because Satan will possess him and control him. But Paul brings out quickly here a little quick reminder too. And number one, he'll be destroyed. Verse three, the man he is the man doomed to destruction. He'll be physically destroyed. God will, God will kill him. Jesus will kill him in an instant with the breath of his mouth. But he'll also experience spiritual destruction because he'll be thrown into the lake of fire forever. Number two, he will oppose and exalt himself over God. Look at verse four. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. By the way, the tense of these verbs here of oppose, he continually opposes God. He continually exalts himself over everything that is called God. He continually proclaims himself to be God. There is an Assyrian monarch that you probably have heard of in the past, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who killed a pig, an unclean animal for the Jew, and killed this pig on the altar of God in the Jewish temple in 167 B.C. He also placed an image of Zeus. It was set up in the most holy place, and it resembled his appearance. And he demanded everyone to worship that image. The desecration, the, the blasphemous acts of that of that man, Antiochus, who, who scattered blood all over the temple artifacts and, and desecrated the temple, it foreshadowed the final abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel in Daniel 9.27. By the way, the Jewish temple was destroyed about 20 years after Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians. But we see here that Antiochus Epiphanes IV is a precursor to the real Antichrist who were revealed one day. So there will be a third Jewish temple that will be built. And this ultimate apostasy will culminate in the Antichrist when the majority of the world worships this man who is totally controlled by Satan and his image will be set up by the false prophet in the Jewish temple that will be built and this image will speak blasphemous words against Jesus Christ and those who do not give him worship, who do not take the mark of the beast, 666, will be beheaded. So the rebellion must occur first and the Antichrist must be revealed. But I want, to, I want you to understand the Antichrist won't be revealed until, let us see, the restrainer is taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians 2.5, Paul said, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? Even though Paul's time with the Thessalonian believers was short, he spent time teaching them about end-time events and end-time truths. 
Verse 6 here, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. There is something holding back the Antichrist right now. He could be he very well maybe alive and, and, and he may be in some form of leadership. I don't know. I can't be dogmatic on it. But there's something that is holding him back right now so that he may be revealed at the proper time. God has a timetable. Amen? Nothing's going to happen too early. Nothing's going to happen too late. It's going to happen exactly to the very moment, to the very second, to the very minute, to the very hour that God has already set in his plans. But that restrainer is holding him back. It means to hold down or to suppress. It's a present tense verb, so this Antichrist is continually being restrained until that right moment. There are a varied opinions on who the restrainer is. More than I care to share with you this morning. I believe, and maybe you have a different opinion, but here's what I think. The restraining power is the Holy Spirit working primarily through the church in the world. Paul says here in verse 7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. We see it everywhere in our government. We saw it last summer in all the riots and all the rebellion and the anarchy and the murder and the and the, uh, the rampage against the police and all the garbage that was going on all across our country. Just a little bit of a taste of lawlessness, right? But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he, masculine noun, is taken out of the way. He is a masculine noun, same word Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit in John 16. Through the Holy Spirit's presence and power, folks, God's children are lights in a dark world. We are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. But when the church is removed at the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, there will be unrestrained evil and corruption in this world that no one has ever witnessed. And there's been a lot of horrible things that have happened in our world through the centuries, but it'll be, it'll be unrestrained. The Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. That is, the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is removed. And then the Antichrist, he'll be revealed, and then the day of the Lord will start. And even though the Holy Spirit no longer restrains evil during the tribulation, the Holy Spirit will still convict non-believers of sin and people will be saved during the tribulation period. Many people will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the gospel will be preached to the world through the 144 Jewish evangelists that will scatter all over the world sharing the gospel, the two witnesses, and also an angel who will announce it from heaven. But can you imagine a world that is fully given over to evil? I mean, we think it's bad now, and I, I, I don't even like watching the news without getting heartburn, right? Bring my tums, you know, I can't take anymore. But, but it's about to intensify and grow exponentially. Murders will skyrocket, immorality and perversion will, will, will permeate every facet of society. I think it already has, but uh, in, a, in a much greater way, all over the world. Once this rebellion occurs and the restrainer is removed and the Antichrist is revealed, then the day of the Lord will begin. 2 Thessalonians 2 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth. Paul mentions it again now, his destruction, and destroy by the splendor or the manifestation or appearance or brightness of his coming. In other words, the time of this Antichrist on the world stage will be brief. Letter D, the rebellion must occur first, the Antichrist must be revealed, the restrainer is taken out of the way, and the deceiver will dupe the world. 
Number one, the Antichrist will deceive through the power of Satan. Look at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. In other word, work is where we get it, the English word energy. Here it refers to the energy of Satan. Everything the Antichrist does will be through the energy of Satan. He is Satan's man. And this energy of Satan will be displayed in counterfeit miracles. Miracles is that Greek word dunamis, means dynamite or power. This Antichrist, this lawless one, would do these miraculous works empowered by Satan. One such miracle will be his own resurrection. Look at Revelation 13, 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound. But the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. There'll be a miracle performed in the energy of Satan. That word signs there refers to tokens or deeds done in order to confirm authority and power. These works will have significance and people will actually think that this is the Messiah. And wonder, I mean, it'll be, people will be in awe of what happened. It'll be on every, it'll be on CNN, I guarantee it. NBC and CBS and ABC and all the news media will be talking about it. It'll be worldwide and, and everybody will be talking about this miracle and be in all of it. Look at Revelation 19.20. The beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had, been, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The whole purpose of all these miracles and signs and wonders was deception. John 8, 44, right? Satan is a liar and a father of lies. His lying, that's his native language, he'll continue to lie and deceive the whole world and, 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 and carry it on into this, this tribulation period. Secondly, Antichrist will deceive those who rejected Jesus. Look at verse 10. And in every sort of evil... So we have the miracle signs and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. And they perish, notice this, because they refused. They refused. These non-believers refuse to love the truth and so be saved. What we see here is an, an exercise of their will. Those who are perishing, it's present tense, it denotes their continuous spiritual condition. They are perishing. Not annihilation. They are, they are facing judgment. They are facing spiritual destruction. And they are facing an eternity separated from God. They are blind and they are deceived. They have chosen the path of destruction. They refuse. They willfully spurn the grace of God. Those who are deceived by the Antichrist, Paul says, are perishing because they refuse to love the truth about God and accept his gift of salvation. And their choice brings about their condemnation. Number three, the Antichrist will deceive those who believe the lie. For this reason, God sends a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Those who reject Jesus and reject the gospel will be judged by God, and he will send a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie. The big lie is the Antichrist. They made the choice to reject the Lord and the gospel, and God accommodated their rebellion and their rejection. He says, all right, you want to reject me, then I will accommodate you, and I will harden your heart and blind you to the truth, and you will believe the lie. 2 Thessalonians 2.12, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Paul told these believers at Thessalonica not to be uns unsettled and afraid. The day of the Lord won't come until the apostasy 
the revealing of the Antichrist, which won't happen until the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is removed. They're already out of here. Then the day of the Lord will start. So how do you take a passage like this today and how do you apply it in your own life? I think it's very fitting for each of us to evaluate our spiritual life. Grace Church, evaluate your own spiritual life. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Owning a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing how to pray doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing some Bible verses don't, it doesn't make you a Christian. Trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sins and trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that'll make you a Christian. Amen? In December of 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 went into the Florida Everglades, crashed into it. The plane was called a TriStar Jumbo Jet. It marked one of the first the first crash of a wide-body aircraft. If you're going on an airplane flight this week, I'm sorry, all right? But the reports uh, claimed that the entire crew was busy focusing on a faulty light bulb. One little light bulb. And they were completely oblivious to the fact that they were rapidly falling in altitude. The crash killed 101 people. But 75 miraculously survived and revealed exactly the details of all that happened in that flight. Say, Pastor Dan, what does that have to do with the tea in China? It has a lot to do with it. Because I think in this world we get so distracted, don't we? We get distracted by our own problems in life, the trying to pay the bills and, and trying to do the job at work and making sure that, that we do our job right and please our boss. And we get distracted by children that, are, that maybe are not behaving like we want to see them behave or we're concerned about their future. And, and we get our mind on a million things that distract us and we get our eyes looking on the light bulb. And in some cases, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're so distracted at everything else and we ignore our own spiritual condition of where we will spend eternity one day when we die. I want to challenge Grace Church to evaluate your spiritual life. You will either meet Jesus as your Savior one day or you will meet him as your judge. You can either become a child of God and face no condemnation or you can reject God and face the condemnation of God. It all depends on your decision and what you do with Jesus. Because at any moment, Jesus is going to snatch believers out of this world and up to heaven. Are you ready to meet him? Do you really, really, really know Jesus personally as your Savior? Have you repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation? I'm passionate about this because I sat in church and I was a fake for so long. For the first 22 years of my life, I was a fake. Religious, a religious fake and Pharisee. And God had mercy on me and saved me. Don't be a fake, because you'll never fake God out. Who knows our heart, and he knows if we're real. If you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, you'll miss the rapture. And you will be left behind. And this world will intensify, and the Antichrist will come on the scene, and evil will just be rampant, and that great deceiver will come and deceive the world, and, and you very likely will be deceived and take that mark and face, and face eternity without Jesus.
Letter B, embrace Jesus by faith to be your Savior. He loves you. He died for the sins of the world. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord's not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, but he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God puts out the call to you today. No one's going to force you. I'm not going to come back there and twist your arm and drag you down the aisle. But the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart and says, you're not ready. You better, you better get ready. Invite him in. All who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right and the authority to become children of God. Embrace Jesus by faith to be your Savior. Let us see you express your love and thanks and praise to God. No matter how difficult your life is, and no matter how, things, how bad things become on earth, remember this, Jesus has already conquered Satan. He is a defeated foe. When the Lord Jesus came and died on that cross and arose again that third day, the works of Satan were destroyed, defeated. He's a defeated foe. Satan's minions, the Antichrist and a false prophet, they'll carry out their devi devious deeds for just a short period, but Jesus will come in power and glory and crush evil. So thank him this day for his forgiveness, his salvation, a heavenly home, and that you will escape the wrath of God that is coming soon upon this world. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to ask Cheryl to come, play softly. But Grace Church, you who know the Lord, let me ask you this. Let me come back to that distraction thing. Are you distracted? When's the last time you had quality time reading God's word and letting the Lord just speak to your heart and meditating on its truths for what God has for you? When's the last time that happened? When's the last time you had a good talk with the Lord and just really poured your heart out to him and worshiped him in your own personal time and talked to him through prayer? I'm not talking God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, amen. I mean, where you just had a serious conversation with the Lord. I think we just get so distracted in our Christian life with schedules and deadlines and pressure and what has to be done next on our things to do list, the next game we have to go to and get ready for. That God just kind of gets left off here. The one who loves us and died for us, who cares so much about our life, he gets left off here in a corner. The one who should be the center and the priority of everything in our life becomes the bottom of the list. And I got a confession to make to you folks today. Sometimes I've been distracted lately. And God has convicted me, and I have repented, and I ask God to help me to get centered again. And I know if it happens to me, it's happening to you. Grace Church, may our focus be on Jesus. Focus on him. Don't be distracted. I always say, Pastor Dan, I want to focus on Christ. I want to get re-centered on Jesus today. Would you pray for me? I will pray for you. God bless you. Pray for me. We just pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father God, so much going on in this world, so much that can distract us. But God, help our focus to be on Jesus. Help us to spend extra time with you, Lord, and extra time in prayer, and extra time in the Word. Carry our problems to you in prayer, not let the problems carry us to an early grave. I pray we grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ and bring honor to your name for whatever time we have left on this earth. God, please help us. And if there's anybody here this morning, say, Pastor Dan, I don't know for sure that if I were to die today that I'd go to heaven. But I want to make that decision today. I want to make sure that when I leave this world one day, that I'll go home to be with Jesus Christ. If that's your heart's desire, and God has tugged at your heart and you want Jesus to be your Savior, would you raise your hand if that's you? Anybody here at all? Pastor Dan, I don't know for sure that I'm going to go to heaven, but I would sure like to know. God says, hey, 
Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. He waits. He knocks on your heart door. Anybody here at all? If you're watching online today and you'd like to invite Jesus into your heart, would you pray this prayer? The meet in your heart. It's not the prayer that saves you, but it's faith in Jesus and Him alone that will save you. Here's that prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know because of my sins that I deserve hell. But I believe, Jesus, that you died on that cross for me over 2,000 years ago. I believe that you rose again that third day. And by faith, by faith, I ask you to forgive my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I trust you, Jesus. I trust your work on the cross. I trust in that resurrection. And from this day forward, I give you the care and the control of my life. Father God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this time together just to be in the word and in prayer and in worship and the fellowship together among believers. In a few moments, we're going to have a meal. I pray you bless it to our bodies and you continue to bless that time together in fellowship. And in Jesus' precious name, amen. All God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, thank you for, for coming out and, and worshiping with us today. And a couple quick things here. We have Father's Day coming up on the 20th. There are men's study. I think the men are getting ready to start James tomorrow night at 7. Uh, Experiencing God Wednesday night. Women's study on heaven on Thursdays. Uh, VBS meeting is Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Right, Brian? Right here at the church. Uh, is it for anybody that's going to work in VBS? All right, so if you're, whatever, any, anybody that's going to be working in VBS, no matter how, how minuscule you think the task is or how big the task, uh, we want you to come 6 o'clock Tuesday night for the VBS meeting. Uh, and then there's a camp fundraiser. And listen, uh, if you didn't come to give money today for the camp fundraiser, then come join us for lunch anyways, all right? There's a lot of food out there. I, I fix my favorite uh, I have a I have a pasta out there dish with liver and cow tongue in it. I think you'll like it a whole lot. Um, somebody else brought a whole pot of head cheese. I think that's really delicious. So I'm just kidding about that. But anyways, we hope you'll stay stay and have some food, fellowship. We'll have fun raising some funds for the kids for camp. And uh, but anyway, that's all I have for you. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>